Allora, per il prossimo ospite, gli diamo veramente un grande benvenuto, perché, come vi dicevo, è la persona che ha inventato nella realtà la tecnologia di Minority Report, è il founder e CEO di Oblong Industries, sulle interfacce veramente è, come dire, una Bibbia, una scienza pazzesca. E quindi cerchiamo di dargli un grande benvenuto. Datemi un, un suono iniziale, quelli che erano in sala stamattina. Datemi un... Che tristezza! Cioè, fermi, allora... Oh, no. Sergio, dammi una musichetta, qualcosa, dammi un qualcosa, dammi un sottofondo, vai. <ride> Pavarotti, abbiamo il Pavarotti in sala. Sergio, dammi una musichetta. Questa è bella, no, cambiala. <ride> ok. Oh, John Undercoffler! Wow. Well, I'm honored to be here with you this morning, and I'm absolutely excited to tell you something about the future of user interface. It's a topic that I personally find uh, thrilling, possibly the most exciting thing of all to work on. I'm dedicating my life to doing that. Uh, but my intent here today is to convince you that user interface is important, that it needs to have a future that's different from the present, and that the future that I'm about to show you uh, is one of the best possible, or at least pointed in the right direction. Now, in order to do this, uh, I don't want to consider the interface, the HMI, the human machine interface, the user interface, the UI, uh, in technical terms. I don't want to, uh, to, to work that way at all. In fact, I think we need to consider it as a very, very primitive, very fundamental kind of construct. So uh, an interface is a kind of communication. It's where two different entities come together, and it's the way that information or intent is transmitted between the two. And so if we use this definition, we can look at other kinds of very, very important interfaces. How about the human-to-human -human interface? Well, that's language. Language is the primary mode in which human beings uh, communicate with each other exchange information, exchange intent. Uh, and the mechanisms involved are, are, of course, the voice and the ears, and that's all. And this is the basis uh, of all of social and intellectual civilization. This is how we tell stories. This is how we record history. This is why we're different from all other species, as far as we know. How about the human-to-universe interface? Well, that's eyes and hands. We use hands both to manipulate and understand the world, and we use eyes to understand the changes that are happening. And this is fundamental, and that's the basis, of course, uh, for all of technological and archaeological and uh, architectural and every other actual piece of civilization. And of course, as well, it's the basis of writing, which turns human voice into permanent marks that can be used later. How about human to computer, human to digital machine? Well, eyes are important, obviously. It's, uh, we're, we're visual beings as human beings. So what we see on the screen or the other device, uh, whatever device we may be using, is critically important. But what about the input? What about our intent? This is where we have a problem, because there's not enough bandwidth. There's not enough meaning being imbued. So to talk about the future, we have to talk about the present. And unfortunately, it's very, very easy to talk about the present of UI, because it doesn't have very many steps, and it only has one really important step. If we start at the beginning, something amazing happened at about 1976 or 1977, which is that computers went from being very specialized, very rare objects that you had to be in a university or a giant company to use, to being something that everyone could afford and everyone could use. And whether it was the Apple II Plus or the Atari 2600 or the TRS-80 or any num number of other uh, easily affordable and accessible machines, the difference was that we moved from scarcity to abundance. Uh, and that's the kind of qualitative change, quantitative change, that begets a qualitative change. Suddenly, everyone could spend all night drinking lots of coffee and inventing new things. And so you got new kinds of things being invented just because of that change. Uh, but this has a very primitive user interface. It has a command line, a one-dimensional string of characters that you type, and out come other characters. So language in, language out. Very, very abstract. The next step is the most important one in the history of the user interface. It's 1984, Apple gives the world the Macintosh. And we change words into pictures. And suddenly, a thousand times, 10,000 times more people can use computers because they're pictorial, because they address the spatial part of the brain. Uh, and this is massive. 
And unfortunately, it's also the last time the user interface ever took a big step. This system is still exactly the same one that we use today. The overlapping windows, the drop-down menus, the scroll bars, the buttons, all of that is what defines the user experience and the user interface today. Very strange. So this is a little more than 30 years ago. What happens next, about 10 years after that, is that the internet and the web come along. Uh, and a very strange thing comes along with it, which is the browser. And the idea of the browser is that, it's, of course, it's a program, but it's the last program you'll ever need. It's one program that can run all programs, which is a good idea. The bad idea is that it now has to reinvent all of this UI stuff inside it. So now you have to have buttons that exist inside this universal browser program. You have to have scroll bars and the rest of it. And so we take 10-year step backwards in terms of the sophistication, the beauty, uh, and the usability of the user interface. And it takes another 10 years before things get back on track, maybe 15 years. Only today, only in the last two years, let's say, is the experience inside the browser as good as the experience was in 1990 or 1994. Then one more thing happens. Uh, and unfortunately, it's another step backwards for the UI. And what happens is this. We go mobile. Uh, and we love that. That's fantastic. Now we can take the computational experience with us wherever we go. It's in our pocket. It's on our laps. It's instantly and permanently and ubiquitously accessible. But in order to make it work, you can't have a keyboard on this thing. You have to have a touch interface. You have to simplify the interface yet again. And this thing can only run one program at a time. That's a huge step backwards. So once again, we've, uh, we've made progress in one direction. It's mobile. But we've lost a lot in, in the translation. And I would submit that just as one example, if you're a journalist, I don't think you probably write stories on your phone. It's not the most powerful tool for that task. So uh, we need to do something about this. We need to make actual progress. Uh, and the reason is that the user interface is fundamental. For us as human beings, it's all we have. The computer has its mind, but you're never going to understand the memory and the logic and all that stuff. The only access that you have to computation is through the UI. So uh, if we want to remain in control of our machines, if we want to be able to do more and more sophisticated things with our machines, we need a better language to talk to them through than the 1984 version of the UI. That's a very simple language for talking to very simple machines. What we have now is 30 years of machine progress. We need a language that's that good. Uh, and there's one extra bit of urgency, which is that very first interface that we talked about, the human to human, now increasingly has digital machines between the two people. So uh, when you send email, when you do anything else, when you use social media, it looks like this, human. Then there's a UI. Then there's something in the middle. One machine, two machines, the cloud, who knows. Then another UI that might be the same or it might be different. And finally, a human on the other end. And anyone who's ever dis been misunderstood in email, which is an easy thing to do, knows how important it is to get that stuff right. Um, and as just another example, of course, of why this stuff is important, uh, we in the United States have just had a very, very strange election, as you all know, I think. Uh, and it is supposed that part of the problem there was that social media was not an adequate tool for conveying news, allowing people to make decisions and interchange information. For example, um, there's like. That's the most basic, primitive thing you can do with social media. You can like something. You can't even not like something. So it's not even binary. So that is not an expressive enough construct. So to make this work, to make this really work, to make it so that humanity has a future, we need a better UI if we're going to put a UI between two humans or many, many different humans. So let's invent that new language. I'm going to show you a bunch of examples. Um, this is not comprehensive. This is not a full definition. But instead, uh, what I'm going to attempt to show is a bunch of different stars that form a constellation that together um, we'll draw a picture for you of what it could be like uh, and what, in some cases, it even is like right now. One, we need to take pixels, those little individual points of light that make up the pictures that the computers show us, and we need to put them in the physical world. We need to make them less abstract and more real. And if you do that, if you pull the pixels out of the displays, out of the flat panel monitors, out of your phones, and you put them in the physical world, and you put the UI in the physical world, then something new happens. Now you can take pieces of physical world 
uh, and interpose them and allow them to interact with the digital world. There's no more intermediation. So this is a digital wind tunnel um, where you can actually run tests with uh, cutout shapes. This is an architecture, uh, an urban planning simulation in which we give architects back physical models, which worked for 3,000 years of architecture. It's just that we confiscated the models when we invented CAD in the 1980s. Now we ask the machine to do the hard work. The machine has to find the buildings, project down shadows. Here's a digital clock. You can set the time and therefore set the position of the sun in the sky and inspect what the shadow does as it moves throughout the day and spins around. Now you can conduct intershadowing studies in a very, very intuitive manner. Intuitive is an important word. Intuition, analogy, these are the ways that we understand the world. And if the digital world can show us results in a way that resonates with our intuition, then we get new kinds of understanding, deeper understanding, uh, and quicker understanding. So here's a, a little tool that allows you to connect uh, structures, buildings, and so forth to other structures uh, and measure distances. And if it understands about zoning regulations in your city, then it can tell you if you're violating them and so forth. And here comes the wind. So you can, uh, you can simulate what happens when a typhoon rolls through your city. So we want to de-abstract display. We want uh, to make a situation in which we as humans are not squinting into an ugly rectangle. We want the pixels to come out and to live in our world. The next principle is that we want to privilege human hands. So human hands are arguably the most uh, highly evolved and dexterous manipulator in the entire animal kingdom. Again, as I said at the beginning, we understand the world using our hands, using touch, and we manipulate the world that same way. Now, if you think what happens when you use a mouse, you take this amazing instrument and you clutch it around a piece of plastic, and now you might as well not have a hand. So we want you to drop the mouse. We want you to use your fingers, use your hand, uh, and put the dexterity back in the world. And what happens is something like this. Here's a system where the computer understands pointing. Pointing is a kind of magical human gesture because it's a geometry gesture. It connects your body to distant space, distant objects, and it's a social gesture. You point for the benefit of other people. When I point, it's not for me, it's for everyone else who can see what I'm pointing to. Now we teach the machine that, uh, and you can connect your body to pixels. You can connect your intent that starts here and goes through here to what you mean to work on, which is over there in the pixels. Sometimes you can reach out and grab artifacts, grab digital objects, spin them around. That's a very literal kind of manipulation and highly satisfying as well. This is sneaky. Here are pixels that uh, remain in space even when the display uh, moves out from under them. Here are some physical pixels which have to submit to the same gestural language. It doesn't matter whether they're abstract light-emitting pixels or flying pixels. And speaking of flying, this is one of the most important kinds of maneuvers, which is to say navigation. You need to be able to fly through three-dimensional space with six degrees of freedom. If we can array uh, information, whether it's literal or abstract, in space and then fly around it, you're using both parts of your brain, the visual part that understands and that proprioceptive part of your brain that understands motion. And you put those together and again, you get new intuition, new understanding. We can build more and more sophisticated interfaces. Uh, that is the front end for the world's largest oil and gas reservoir simulator, where understanding is, needs to be literal. You need to be able to see uh, the entire space, then fly in and look at a little piece of it. And you can do remarkable things when you can work gesturally. Here we are looking at some medical imaging, and on and on like that. This is an, uh, an air traffic control simulator, where we've got six weeks of air traffic control, data uh, stored inside the system. We can fly through space, fly through time, observe the patterns in the air in a way that, uh, that is absolutely tuned to the way that human beings think. And just the idea that you can always reach out and grab data and pull it toward you makes the stuff instantly accessible. When you work this way, more than one person can access the data. So suddenly computers become opportunities for collaboration, for communication between people, instead of barriers that keep people apart. Thank you. So for 30 years, computers have taken away our hands, taken away our dexterity. We just want to give that back, and it's entirely possible. One of the things that's great is that when you give it back, 
everyone immediately knows what to do. You don't have to train anyone how to point. Everyone is already an expert at pointing. Everyone is already an expert at grabbing objects, manipulating them, moving them around to understand them. If you give people information in that absolutely natural form, then everyone is immediately an expert. Three, we need computers, programs, uh, and the applications that these programs represent to understand space. Uh, not abstract space, but actual human-scale architectural space. We need the pixels to understand that they live in the world. And what happens then is something like this. So here's a little bit of media, and it's running around five different displays, five screens of different sizes, being driven by three different computers that are running two different low-level operating systems. And none of that matters, because what matters is the experience. The human gets exactly what she or he expects, which is that if there are pixels, then you get a single conformed view of the underlying data. Uh, it doesn't matter where the displays are. And so that's a new kind of boundarylessness. That's a system where the physical edges of the display are no longer a boundary to the information or to the interaction. Here's a second example where a little bit of data, uh, a synthetic tree is being pulled from a giant Linux-based screen to a small Macintosh-based screen. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that these are different operating systems. It doesn't matter that they're different resolutions. It doesn't matter that they're uh, separated in space. In fact, it's valuable that they're separated in space. You can array data around you using all of the space that architectural space gives you. So we want to be able to ignore boundaries. We want the digital world, the visual digital world, to behave like the physical world. You see as a human being in parallel. In the computer world, you're asked to see and pay attention to only one thing at a time. We can break that open again, and we can make the digital world act like the physical world. Four, we need new analogies. As user interface designers, we need to stop thinking about computer science. In fact, we need to pay attention to computer science last of all. We need to pay attention to the history of UI last of all. Instead, we need to study all the other human forms, all the other human arts, that express motion through space and intent and narrative through time. So we need to study architecture, we need to study biology, we need to study dance, all the way through the alphabet. And if we stop at C in the alphabet, we need most of all to study cinema. Because cinema is that human invention that describes the evolution of bodies, human bodies, but also all sorts of objects through time. And that describes the evolution of narrative through time. And that describes the evolution of emotion through time. That is an incredible tool. It's 100, 10, 120 years old, and it's been an output-only medium for the entire history of that art form. If we can make it an input-output medium, then something remarkable happens, because by the time each of us is six or seven years old, we have absorbed 120 years of film history, uh, montage, editing, uh, mise-en-scene, all the rest of it. We all have it in our heads. If we can use it as a voice and not just as an input, then that's very, very powerful. And this is an experiment that shows what that could be like. Uh, and it's a bit of Ouroboros, it's a bit of the snake swallowing its own tail because we're going to use the language of cinema to manipulate cinema. So in this space, we have uh, 18 films, and we can uh, navigate through the films in space, then we can navigate through the films in time, and once you get to, to an individual scene with elements you like, you can grab them, grab props, grab vehicles, grab bits of uh, architecture or scenery or characters, put them on a composing table, uh, and then go next door to another film made by a different director in a different country in a different year, grab additional elements, and put them together uh, on the composing table in what amounts to cinematic heresy. These pieces were never meant to go together, and maybe this is a bad thing. But for us at Oblong, this is an analogy, this is a metaphor. This is a depiction of how powerful the user interface should allow you to be in accessing and manipulating and recombining your own stuff. We don't want a one-button world that says play and pause. We want a world where, if it's your data, you can do anything with it that you want, to the extent of your imagination or your own synthetic will. Again, you see the idea that there's no boundaries that stop at the edges of screens or displays anymore. Pixels can fly through space, just like physical objects. Um, and there's another principle at work here as well, which is, of course, how do we know when a UI is good? For us at Oblong, a UI is good if it is exhilarating, if it gives you a visceral sense uh, of pleasure or anxiety or any of the other things that you feel in your stomach, UI can be that good. It can feel as exciting as uh, playing the saxophone. 
uh, or running or scuba diving or any of the other things that human beings do that remind us that we're a mind inside a physical body and that those two things are joined. The computer, so far, has been mostly an activity for the mind. We need to combine the mind and the body once more. And five, this is a really interesting one, and I don't see it being discussed, and I don't quite understand why, although I have some theories. Um, we've been told implicitly over the last five years, ten years, that this is the proper scale for computation. The computation looks like this. Maybe it looks like a tablet, and if you're really, really serious, maybe it looks like a laptop, but no bigger than that. Here's the question. Does all work fit on this? If you're a brain surgeon, will you plan a surgery on this? If you're, trying to, uh, if you're trying to respond to an emergency situation at city scale, an earthquake has happened, do you solve the problem on this? The answer, self-evidently, is no. Uh, and it's not a problem with this. This is a great device. It's just simply not big enough. It's not physically able to contain all of the interaction, all of the visualization, all of the data, all of the ideas that you need to address the problem. So I'm going to suggest that every kind of human work, every kind of human problem, has an, a natural scale, a natural physical scale. Uh, if you have a shopping list, then this is actually a great device. If you've got an emergency uh, uh, here in Milano, this is not a great device. You need more space. And so, uh, at Oblong, we do a lot of experimentation with large-scale visualization, large-scale interaction, and large-scale computation. Here's our secret warehouse, where we have a number of different display formats that allow multiple people to work on problems that are this big and something very different happens. And I think you can get a sense of it, even though this is just a video recording of this situation. Here we've got a chunk of a city. This is actually Los Angeles in low-resolution low data format. But now you get the sense that you can swim through the data, and you understand it with your body. You understand it as you would understand a landscape walking through it. That's a very different kind of understanding. And you apply that to every conceivable kind of problem, every conceivable kind of analysis. Uh, for medical imaging, the idea that you can start with a brain and pull yourself inside it to inspect a small area um, whose, uh, whose function you're trying to investigate or whose pathology you're trying to analyze. Uh, again, this is a very, very different kind of way of working, but arguably it's a much more natural way of working. And so we want to find at every, at every moment the correct scale uh, of display that is matched to the problem at hand. Here's, uh, here's 30 years of financial data. And of course, it's widely understood if you study economics or you study the stock market or anything else, everyone knows that you can't see patterns in data. But maybe it's just because we haven't been looking at the right scale. Maybe if we can see with our entire field of view, our entire human vision, maybe it is possible to see some patterns. Maybe not, but it's worth trying, I think. Uh, and then we can begin to combine modes. So here is an input device that is a physical globe that we can use to turn uh, six years of seismic data. These are all of the earthquakes that have happened on planet Earth for the past six years. And now we can use a spatial control device, a wand, to manipulate the globe at the same time. So we've got rotation here, we've got translation there. Now you're using both hands, which again, all human beings know how to do. Uh, it's just computers that haven't let us do that. So we want to give the interface uh, access to all of the parts of the human experience uh, that are already built in. We'll skip that. Uh, sure, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what that was. So we need to embrace scale. Again, we need to find the right scale of computation, the right scale of display for each problem at hand. And that has a lot of implications for how you write programs, how you expect programs to behave, uh, but we won't get into that today. I want to try out a new idea today, so we'll take a brief intermission between these videos. And the idea is this. Over the last few years, there's been a lot of excitement, a lot of interest, and a lot of attention paid to the world of AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, and it's very exciting. It's very imaginative. It's very science fiction. When you work on AI, you're essentially investing in machines. You're making a bet on the computer you're saying that the computer is going to be where the solution is. And I'm going to propose that, by contrast, if you pay attention to UI, user interface, which far fewer people do, you're doing something else that should be valuable. You're making a bet on the human being. You're saying that, in fact, uh, what we want... Well, let, let me stop here. We want both. We want AI, we want machine vision, 
we want machine learning, we want all the rest of those tools that let us deal with big data and the rest of it. I'm not proposing that we get rid of that. But I think we also need to make a bet on the human being. We need to invest in the human being. Because no matter what else happens, for the next thousand years at least, the smartest computer in the room will always be the one in here and there and there and there, the one inside the human skull. So why aren't we building extensions to this computer? That's what the UI is. The UI is an amplifier for humanity, an amplifier for human intent, human will, human analysis, and all the things that we do as human beings. So let's dive into the one example uh, in all of these videos that is fictional. I'm going to speak for just a brief moment uh, about Minority Report, the 2002 Steven Spielberg film. I served as the science advisor on that film uh, and had responsibility for all of the technology that you see in the film. But the most interesting part to me was, of course, the UI. And I wanted to show a couple of new ideas, uh, fictionally, in that film by depicting that future UI. But it's not what people think it was. A lot has been written about how it was a gestural interface, and that's true. The gesture was cool, the gesture was instructive, the gesture was useful to study, but it was a small piece of the whole thing. What I wanted to show instead was that more fundamental idea that with a proper UI, a human being can get more done. A human being can get things done that you couldn't do any other way. And so what we have in these scenes that are now iconic from the film is a team of police investigators who are able to sift through mountains of data, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of images, video sequences that are extracted from the, the heads of the psychic kids floating in the bath. Uh, but there's no AI. It's very interesting to notice there's no AI in the film. What the film is saying is that these are very smart cops and with this user interface, they're able to sift through the data and form conclusions. And this is a really important set of conclusions to form. They have six minutes to find all of the details around the murder that's about to happen, who, where, when, not why, of course, uh, and then get to the scene and stop the murder before it happens. There's a second thing that I wanted to show that no one has written about, which is that this, for the first time, uh, in film or in reality is a collaborative user interface. So for the first time, it's not just one person using the computer. Now, of course, Tom Cruise is a very highly paid actor, so we spend time with him using it. But if you go back and look at these scenes, you'll actually see that there's a small team of people working together. So this is a UI that allows people to exchange information, allows people to work together with the computer rather than despite the computer. And this, in a way, the fact that the people got very excited about these scenes was the trigger for us at Oblong uh, to feel that now was the time. Now is the moment to build that next generation user interface. And so if we look at the sequence, in about 1976, we get the Apple II Plus. In 1984, 85, 86, we get the real graphical user interface. In 1996, we get the web. In 2006, we get mobile computing. And here in 2016, 2017, it's time to move into the next generation of actual UI that's intended to amplify human beings. So all of the stuff we've looked at so far, in a sense, is experimental. These are experiments we've run internally at Oblong, prototypes we've built. What I'm showing you now is not a prototype. This is a system uh, in use on six continents by many uh, of our customers, many of our clients. And it is a collaborative computer. The idea is that uh, each of us carries around uh, an electronic brain or multiple electronic brains, laptops, uh, tablets like this, smartphones, but they can't really interoperate. They're anti-collaboration machines. The idea in this environment is that you bring those machines and you bring your actual brains into the room, and these now are shared pixels. All of the displays on the wall are architectural, democratic pixels that everyone can inject content into using a variety of different devices, a spatial pointing wand, tablets, phones, laptops, browsers, whatever you have, all of it, every piece of it is a tributary that flows into a larger river and that river is the set of screens around the room that are shared among all the participants. And it's an entirely new way of working and yet it's a very, very old way of working because again, one of the most important clues that we have as UI designers is what people do without computers. What do people do in architecture? We build architecture as human beings for ourselves at different scales uh, to attack problems, to undergo different kinds of human work uh, and, and human interaction. And so if uh, a bunch of 
urban planners need to solve a problem, they come into a room. If that room is not infested with computation, they unroll maps uh, on the table. They go to a whiteboard or a blackboard, they make marks. You take a drawing off the wall and you move it over here to another wall, and by juxtaposing it with other drawings, other diagrams, you create meaning. And so this system uh, synthesizes all of the principles that we've looked at in the past, all of the stuff we've looked at so far. It's architectural, it's collaborative, it's spatial, and so on. And when all of this comes together, what you have is a digital architecture that feels like physical architecture. And again, everyone is an expert at occupying rooms, at working in rooms, and using space. And so, for us at Oblong, this is inevitable. This is a necessary part of how we must move into the digital future. Work just has to be like this. It's the most obvious way, it's the most powerful way, uh, and it's not at odds with the way that we already work. So this is tremendously exciting for us to see, to see how uh, people in all sorts of different fields, all the way from commercial real estate to oil and gas, to energy, to manufacturing, on and on and on, insurance, financial services, every vertical you can imagine is now using these systems because this is the future of general computation. This is an admission, this is a recognition that pixels are a universal interchange format. If you can make all pixels work with all other pixels, then you've got it. So we need to default to collaboration. We need to make sure that every program we write from now on Every set of expectations that we have about how programs will work, how applications will work, and how we will use computers with each other assumes that more than one person will be involved. If you need to work alone, that's still fine. You can always do that. But if you only build systems for one person to use at a time, then collaboration is impossible. We need to build collaboration in from the beginning. This is one final piece. Um, this has never been shown publicly before. And this is the step beyond that. So what we saw with Mezzanine is a system where the pixels can run around and play together. The pixels from this laptop join with the pixels from this smartphone or this tablet, and you can move them around, you can juxtapose them and create meaning visually inside the human brain. This is the final step beyond that in which people are collaborating, but programs are also collaborating. So I'll try to narrate my way through it. What you see is a large display surface, people with individual laptops, uh, and proximity now has meaning. So as you approach the large screen, the program jumps from your laptop across the empty space to occupy the screen. But it's now occupying the screen with all the other programs that are running. And because the programs uh, are running on the same system and because they use an underlying API that lets them talk to each other about what their capabilities are, they can now interact. So programs that were not necessarily written or designed to interoperate now automatically interoperate. They also interoperate spatially, which is important for us as human beings because that's how we understand the world. So if two people change positions, as you saw a moment ago, then the programs follow them around. So this, I think, is the final step. This is what we need to build, uh, and this is the way the world needs to go if we're going to make that transition to a world where we still control the machines, where we still allow the machines to serve us, um, rather than, as some science fiction would have it, the other way around. Uh, and this is how the future of work will look. So to summarize, I think um, we need to be more assertive as human beings, as customers of digital devices and digital systems. We need to insist that we are not one-button organisms. We're not a play-pause species. We're not a order some more music now and that's the only thing you can do species. Um, Einstein said that uh, every explanation should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And it's actually possible to build digital systems, to build programs, to build uh, systems for understanding that are too simple. I think we've gotten into this trap, we've gotten into this bad habit, and we need to raise the level of sophistication back up until it feels human, until it feels like we can say everything that we mean uh, and have the machines listen to us. Because at the end of the day, that's what we want. We want to stand as human beings. We want to use machines to amplify our attention uh, rather than diminish it or chop it up into little pieces so that we can imbue every moment, every action with meaning uh, and work in that uniquely beautiful and human synthetic mode where we make something out of nothing. Thank you.
John Underkoffler. John, thank you so much. Really, Thanks. thank you so much. Great to see I'll you. Let's go for you. Thanks.